these people coming into the United States also from China. And so you can dramatically see um, the potential for transmission into the U.S. at least slowing down. And our hope is that we can slow it down enough for us to be able to pause and work through a lot of what we need to understand about this virus in order to be able to better control it. Um, I want to go to Anne-Marie and ask, uh, what should reporters know about what's happening within the healthcare system and at hospitals um, as people prepare for this outbreak? Uh, and does it differ much from what they're doing already on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, yeah, and let me just say it's, it's a real honor to be here. And um, so I'm an infection preventionist, and there are professionals like myself all over the country in all sorts of different healthcare facilities. And right now, all of us are um, very busy trying to prepare for uh, this evolving situation. But we are professionals who have expertise in um, preventing infections in patients, in their families, in healthcare workers, uh, and in the community, actually. And so we have that expertise, whether it be uh, germs that we're used to seeing on a day-to-day -day basis causing infections, or if it's something more novel like this, or outbreak situations, um, and some of them that come to mind, of course, would be uh, uh, swine flu, measles, uh, SARS, Ebola. So these are things that we are very um, used to dealing with, I would say. Not that you're ever ready for a pandemic or uh, you know, something that spreads throughout uh, the globe, and hopefully that's not going to happen. But at any rate, um, this is not something that we're not planning for at all times and uh, helping our staff uh, it hopefully have sort of a constant readiness, if you will. Um, so in terms of coronavirus specifically right now, I would say that there's a couple different things that, that we're all working very hard at. One would be uh, checking to see where we're at in terms of our supplies that would be needed for healthcare providers to protect themselves as well as patients. So that would be things like gloves, masks, gowns. Um, so we're all very uh, carefully checking where we're at with that. And as you probably know, several of the manufacturers are in China. So that is something that everybody is thinking about and how that might affect us down the road. Um, so it's important that, uh, that we look to see where we're at and that we educate the public about not using masks inappropriately at this point, uh, or healthcare providers using them inappropriately. Um, so the supply chain is very, very important right now. And then along with that, the personal protective equipment that I mentioned, the gloves, the gowns, the masks, and so forth, um, we are trying to retrain and remind our healthcare force uh, of what we went through during Ebola in particular and SARS prior to that. Uh, about the importance of putting on the equipment correctly and just as important, sometimes more importantly, taking it off correctly. We know that when SARS was a situation, um, some of the healthcare providers that were infected from SARS, it happened as a result of them taking off the PPE incorrectly. So that's something that we're working with our, our uh, healthcare providers and personnel uh, from the environmental service workers all the way up to the physicians and whatnot. Um, so making sure the supplies there, making sure they know how to wear stuff correctly, uh, reminding them of just the basic principles of infection prevention. As you know, we're in the middle of a very difficult flu season and um, one of the most difficult ones in quite some time. And so, you know, constantly reminding people about the importance of respiratory hygiene, covering your cough, uh, cleaning your hands. Um, so that is all very important. And then the next thing besides supplies is we're looking at screening and reminding our staff of the importance of screening uh, patients before they enter a facility or before they come to their doctor's office. And again, this is something that staff should be doing 24-7, 12 months a year, all the time. 
But as you can imagine, uh, when you're not in the middle of a crisis, sometimes things start to slip a little bit. And so it's a, a very important time to remind them that we should be doing travel screening. Um, and it can be as simple sometimes as coming from New York City. It doesn't necessarily, if, I'm thinking measles now, it doesn't necessarily have to be coming from China. And uh, so again, reminding them that travel is always an important thing to be checking with patients. We're even uh, helping people understand that when they have patients call in for an appointment, that we're asking them, well, you're coming for what reasons? And if indeed they're giving us symptoms, whether it be a rash, fever, things like that, that uh, we're trying to educate the patient before they get there and perhaps seeing them outside of the physician's practice or the emergency department um, um, before they actually get in there. And um, so those are two, two important things then. So supplies, training, uh, screening, and then last but always so important, and that is communication. And um, so all of us are very actively trying to stay abreast of the changes that are going on, and thank goodness uh, for the CDC and our local health departments, our state health departments. So we as infection preventionists are trying very hard to stay in touch with the changes as they happen from day to day. And uh, so communication, education, uh, all of that is, is always important, but certainly this heightens everybody's awareness in terms of the importance. Thank you. Um, let me go to Amanda and sort of pose a similar question, but on a more global scale. Um, what do you think is important to understand about, you know, what might be happening with the global response right now and, um, it, you know, health ministries or health departments around the world? Sure. I, th I think uh, everything that's just been said, except with no resources and no money and no technical specialists. Uh, <laughs> And that's not to overstate it, but, but uh, you know, we specifically look at, uh, we work uh, a lot with Africa, but there is a, um, a checklist that the World Health Organization has called the Joint External Evaluation. It helps us assess health systems and how ready they are for epidemics. And essentially, every country in the world scores below the perfect score. Even America and Australia are, are at the top, but no one is fully prepared. Uh, and... And as Emery said, it's very hard to be prepared for all levels uh, at a pandemic level. So some of the countries we work at, uh, if we, I was on the phone today with Zimbabwe. Uh, it's been in the media. They haven't been able to pay their doctors and nurses for several months. Uh, and the, the health system is collapsing there. So you're trying to prepare for a large scale uh, pandemic, potentially with no salaried staff. Uh, we're working in Nigeria at the moment. We have a team there. They have a large Lassa fever outbreak at the moment, a highly infectious viral hemorrhagic fever, 100 cases last week, more than 35 healthcare workers killed in the same epidemic last year because of failures in PPE. So as they try to prepare and, and resolve Lassa fever, they're also trying to prepare for coronavirus. We're finally getting close to maybe defeating Ebola in DRC. And they have 400,000 cases of measles with 6,000 deaths. So as big as this outbreak is, the measles outbreak in DRC is unprecedented. So many of the countries that we're supporting with and working with have weak underlying health systems and high risks of other outbreaks while they're then trying to manage this. And they, don't, they have uh, huge connections with uh, China. So many of our, our counterparts in Africa, a million uh, Chinese in Nigeria uh, at the moment, uh, heavy trade and travel uh, links that are extremely important to fragile economies um, and then a lack of diagnostics so being able to detect those first cases so we're really prioritizing very similar to the same things that CDC and, and the US hospitals are prioritizing um, uh, early detection early response early containment but still trying to maintain a health system uh, and control the other outbreaks that are ongoing Thank you. Um, so since you, you, you said the word pandemic, one of our goals here was to, you know, maybe help define some terms. I see a lot of reporters in the room who cover healthcare on a day to day basis, but maybe some of the people watching at home don't. Um, so I'll, I'll throw this out to any of you, but maybe we can t talk about the difference between an outbreak, an epidemic uh, and a pandemic. I think that actually an outbreak and an epidemic are actually really similar in definition. I think people use the word outbreak sort of to sort of 
explain something smaller and the word epidemic may be something bigger, but technically they're actually both the same thing and we at CDC pretty much use them interchangeably. What's different about a pandemic is that you have transmission of um, the out epidemic in multiple geographic locations at once. So what's going on right now in China would definitely be defined as an epidemic, but the definition of a pandemic requires the same kind of transmission in another geographic location. So I think folks could argue this, but in general, the other part about this is that what really causes a pandemic is the, um, it's a new pathogen that the society hasn't seen before, which means that there's not any underlying immunity. Therefore, the whole population doesn't have any protection against it. And if that same um, pathogen spreads, again, in other geographic areas, that's a setup for a pandemic. Most people, when they use the word pandemic, they're thinking of something like influenza, because that is the prototypical disease that we have been preparing for, for which we've seen pandemics before and for which we'll know we'll see one in the future. Great. Uh, maybe we can do a bit of a lightning round of some other terms. Um, what is an R naught? Is that a me too? R naught is a, um, a, a word that's meant to convey the level of infectiousness of a pathogen. So it's the number of people that are infected by a patient who has the illness. So if the illness is only transmitted from one person to the next, that would be an R naught of one. The R naught for coronavirus, the estimates are that it's somewhere in the two to four range, which means every person that has it infects somewhere between two and four. Um, measles, since you brought it up, has one of the highest R naughts. That's somewhere around 14 to 16, which is why people call it the most infectious of the pathogens. And you want your R naught to be below one that's how you know that you're getting the disease under control, that there are less people getting the infection than had it in the first place. Um, incubation period. You yeah. and everybody. Sure. <laughs> um, incubation period is just uh, how we term it from when you're exposed to, to the germ or the virus or the bacteria to how long you start to show symptoms. Uh, and so it can range for different diseases. The, the current range, I think there was a new paper came out yesterday showing the average uh, incubation period was around three days, but extending right out, uh, one case report out to 24 days. So the incubation period, I think, is still to be confirmed. Um, but it, it's something that's really important to us because it, it explains how long uh, people go in terms of before they get sick and it, it, it can affect how we report diseases and how many people are circulating that have been exposed to this disease before they're starting to present symptoms. Maybe if I can add, you know, this incubation period is a, is a really big deal because it directly um, impacts how long we say people should be quarantined or how long people should stay home. So for this pathogen, the, the, the starting place is somewhere, it seems, around two days. The question is really, what's the longest incubation period? And um, it's hard with this disease because we don't fully understand the spectrum of illness. And the question really is, are people mostly transmitting when they have symptoms? Or is it being transmitted from somebody who is mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic? Some of the other issues is that, you know, this is happening really quickly and the press is great. It's great that you guys cover these stories. Some of the reports that are coming out for some of these longer incubation periods aren't exactly yet in the peer-reviewed literature and so sometimes it's hard.